Tonight we will show the powerful documentary, Battle for the Barriers, conceived by Mr. Tom Evans, former Delaware congressman and author of the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. The documentary showcases these environmental issues on a global and national scale. Following the screening, Mr. Evans will lead a panel discussion that, through conversation with the panelists and Mr. Evans, will explore the particular environmental impacts on Delaware. As this is part of a new series, we very much appreciate your feedback, and I believe you might all be sitting on an evaluation sheet, or there is one on your chair, so if you wouldn't mind filling one of those <coughs> out and leaving it with us, that would be wonderful. But before I sort of pass the mic to Mr. Evans, who will introduce the documentary and lead the panel, I want to briefly introduce the panelists and then Mr. Evans. So Jennifer Atkins, if you don't mind standing up. <laughs> so we're showing the documentary, so they're here now. Has been active in conservation planning and collaboration in the Mid-Atlantic region for more than 15 years. In 2007, she was appointed to the position of Executive Director of the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. As Executive Director, Atkins works to partner with and secure funding from two regional offices in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, three states including Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, four major metropolitan municipalities including Camden, Philadelphia, Trenton, and Wilmington, and a host of other organizations and businesses spread across more than 6,700 square miles of the Mid-Atlantic region. Atkins is a graduate of the University of Delaware and holds a Master of Public Administration degree specializing in environmental and energy management, as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in economics. Alice Durant is originally from Virginia and has a BA from the College of William and Mary. She worked for seven years on various archaeological sites in Virginia before joining the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, Delaware State Historic Preservation Office in 1980. She has conducted archaeological testing at division properties, including the John Dickinson Plantation, the New Castle Courthouse Museum, and the Lindens near Smyrna, as well as performed a number of functions in the office, including review of federal projects for their effort on historic properties, public outreach on archaeology at numerous events. She is also in charge of the Research Center, the State Central Repository of Information on Historic Buildings, Structures, Landscapes, and Archaeological Sites. Sue McNeil is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the, at, the, at the University of Delaware. She received her PhD at Carnegie Mellon University and is a recipient of a number of honors and awards, including Outstanding Civil Engineering Professor, Benjamin Tier Teaching Award, Convocation Medal for Professional Excellence, and is a distinguished member of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Her research interests include transportation asset management, application of advanced technologies, economic analysis, and condition assessment and deterioration modeling. Kelly Lindsay is a native Delawarean and the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the Delaware National Estuarine Research Reserve. In this role, she helps communities and natural resource managers prepare for a changing climate through professional training opportunities and direct technical assistance. Kelly brings to this position a strong background in public policy and environmental conservation. She holds an MA in Urban Affairs and Public Policy from the University of Delaware and has previously worked with the University of Delaware's Water Resources Agency, the Delaware General Assembly, the Brandywine Conservancy, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, the Office of, Cong Office of Congressman Mike Castle, and the National Wildlife Federation. So some of the panelists have brought some literature and materials with them on those tables, so please have, um, or take a second towards, or at the end of the program to um, grab some of, some of the materials. I've had the pleasure of speaking with and getting to know Mr. Tom Evans over the last couple of months in preparing this program, and I've learned a lot, and I've been inspired by his passion for the environment and for his leadership. He is a graduate of the University of Virginia with a BA and LLB, and has been a leader in education, sports, politics, human rights, and the environment. Tom has served on the boards of many corporations and nonprofit organizations, and also has a senior, and also as a senior partner in two law firms with offices in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. He was co-chairman and chief operating officer of the Republican National Committee, headed economic development in Delaware, served as chairman of the Congressional Committee for Ronald Reagan, and in the Reagan Kitchen Cabinet. In Congress, as a result of his ability to work across the aisle and the respect his colleagues had for him, 
He was successful in securing passage of major legislation like the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, as well as the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. Justin Gillis of the New York Times called the passage of the Coastal Barrier Resources Act monumental, a monumental triumph that continues to pay dividends. John Sweeney, the former editorial page editor of the News Journal in Delaware, said the act stands as one of the wisest pieces of legislation ever passed by Congress. President Reagan called it a triumph for national resource conservation and fiscal responsibility. Colin O'Mara, president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, said in a letter to Tom at Christmas that the National Wildlife Federation has voted to honor you with a special award for leadership in conservation. Your lifelong dedication to help protect and maintain America's natural resources and landscape are an inspiration. Your partnership with the Florida Wildlife Federation has led to a number of successful initiatives. You have truly been an, an inspiration. That's enough from me, and please join me in welcoming Mr. Evans and our panelists tonight for a very thought-provoking program. Thank you all very much. It's a great pleasure to be here at the Delaware Historical Society. I consider it across the street, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm here. Uh, first of all, Katie, thank you for sharing this and, and, uh, and all your help uh, and, and securing all these wonderful panelists that we're going to hear from a little, little bit. And uh, Mary Page, uh, she's the famous one in the family. She's a damn good artist. And uh, anyway, I, and Bobby, Bobby Appleby, uh, he's why I'm here. <laughs> he, he and Joe recommended me to uh, Scott Moore and, and others. And Scott, I'm glad, glad to see you. And uh, I have a, have a book right here that I've read and I recommend it very highly. It's called Lincoln's Final Hours by Kathy Canavan. And Kathy has done a superb job of research and she's a brilliant writer. And her husband is here also, who has become a good friend. When he started writing stories about me, uh, he wasn't a good friend, but uh, <laughs> We have a, a copy, I think, of probably the best history of the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, and it's over there. It was, uh, it was done in uh, June of, of 2015, and uh, not long ago. And uh, he's, he's still actively involved with John Dickinson. Somebody said, you know, I understand he's retired. I said, John is never going to retire, that's for sure. Anyway. Our, our nation today is much more polarized than any other time I can remember. Uh, I've certainly ne never seen the extreme partisanship that exists. And extreme partisanship, as our founding fathers, all of them said, could break down our system. We need to do a number of things, and it begins with listening and respecting what others have to say. And we, take a, we need to take a look at the history. It teaches us a lot. The years following the Second World War were a great example of looking at the longer term and not just the short term. The military occupation of Japan, hated by, headed by General Douglas MacArthur, uh, he was responsible for giving the Japanese their respect and their dignity back. And that for this world. He followed the golden rule and it worked. And America took a giant step after the war that required longer-term vision. We created the Marshall Plan in 1948, the first time the victor had ever helped the vanquished. It followed the golden rule. And I sometimes wonder what the Tea Party and some of our nominees for president would have said about this decision that made such a difference for the United States and the world. I wonder if they even have any knowledge about the Marshall Plan. One of the first things Germany did, by the way, was restore the Opera House in Munich. And they are, arts are important in many, many ways. The United States established the GI Bill. It was transformational. It really had a great deal to do with creating the, the middle class in America. And all of those things took vision and some courage also. 
you couldn't see the results immediately. And that's especially true today in working on behalf of our environment. That's why we created a documentary entitled Battle for the Barriers. The film was produced by a good friend, Sharon Baker, who would be here tonight, but she's out filming. She's the president of an award-winning company called Teleductions. And it all started with an article written by Justin Gillis of the New York Times, who said in his article that the Coastal Barrier Resources Act was the most important environmental piece of environmental legislation that nobody's ever heard of. And uh, that, that needs to be repeated. I know, know you said that. Uh, but he also said in his article that its passage was mon a monumental triumph that continues to pay dividends. Uh, President Reagan called it a triumph for natural resource conservation and for fiscal responsibility. And I hope this film will help inform Americans about the value of barrier lands and the wetlands they protect. We need to adapt to the certainty of sea level rise, and the Coastal Barrier Resources Act helps us toward that goal. And that's the focus of this film. When John Chafee and I introduced similar bills in the House and in the Senate, no one gave them any chance of passage. Uh, they were opposed by the oil companies, the National Realtors Association, the National so Association of Home Builders, and the phalanx of lawyers and lobbyists who were employed to represent them and fight us in what we were doing. We built coalitions in Congress, and we built coalitions outside, like the National Wildlife Federation, the Coast Alliance, hunters and fishermen, the American Red Cross, taxpayers for common sense, Americans for the Coast, the National Association of Servers, and on and on. Gradually, over a period of 17 months, we emphasized the value of COBRA and its common sense approach. On these storm-prone, vulnerable land, lands, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever to subsidize development. And I've said many times, including uh, times that I've testified before the Resources Committee, which I've done quite often, you know, we said to developers of you know, these storm-prone areas, it's fine for you to develop. To develop. This is a market-oriented bill, the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. But if you develop, do it on your own nickel and not the American taxpayer. It doesn't make sense to use the taxpayer dollars to subsidize development on storm-prone, vulnerable areas. In other words, we didn't prohibit development. We only prohibited subsidies, including flood insurance, construction of roads, jetties, sewers, and the like. The legislation passed overwhelmingly, but that doesn't reflect to any degree how difficult it was to achieve that goal. Democrats and Republicans back then worked together. It didn't make any difference whether you were Democrat or Republican. If you wanted something done, and it was important for the country, we did work together. We had lots of, lots of disagreements. I had disagreements with some of my friends on the, on the, on the Democratic side and the Republican side, but we have a drink or two at the end of the day and have dinner together, and we'd still be friends even though we disagreed with each other very strongly. The land, so I guess what's happening today is very important too. And the land that the system has mostly held, that this coastal ferry system has not been destroyed, it's mostly held. About 7% of the land has been taken out of the system, but the other 93% is still there but we're under constant threat. It's constantly under attack where technical amendments are introduced by members of Congress driven by a lot of money to take land out of the system and make it available for federal subsidies. As I said, I've testified a number of times before the Resources Committee. We need help to preserve the integrity of COBRA. We need help with the media, with environmental groups, and at elementary schools and universities and clubs and retirement homes. 
a wide variety across America. They need to know more about the Coastal Barrier Resources Act and they need to know more about climate change and what's happening with climate change. I think it's probably the most profound issue facing this planet. That's what our film is all about and to help more people understand the value of the barrier lands and the wetlands they protect. And after the film of 32 minutes, this panel will pose and answer questions. Enjoy the film. Remember that the severity of Katrina in New Orleans would not have been as destructive if all the wetlands had been preserved. Thank you all very much for being here. We're going to ask each other a set of, set of questions here first. We haven't rehearsed this, by the way. And then after that, you all chime in and ask any, any kind of questions you want. And if you want to stay later and, uh, and talk to me, I'll, I'll be here, Mary Page, if you'll stay with me. And uh, I will remind you that uh, that, uh, that article, or uh, well, the editorial by, um, by our friend from from the News Journal at the time, who I think was the, one of the best editors they've ever had, uh, was a wonderful article on the history of the Coastal Barrier Resources Act and how it, how it came about, how it happened, and, what, and the things that it has done. Why don't we start alphabetically, Jennifer, with, uh, with, with you. Uh, let me say just a few words about the executive director of the partnership with the Delaware Estuary, who essentially is, uh, is also the uh, chairman of the Clean Water Task Force. Tell us, I don't have the tell us, a, one of tell us about, <laughs> she, one, of her, one of her people who works with us was written up in a, in a very good article about holding back the rising sea that was in the News Journal uh, not too many days ago, yeah. actually. Tell us about what's happening with, uh, with our marshland, with our wetlands. Well, I'd be happy to, and it's really one of the, um, do, I, do I need this, can you hear me? Um, so the, the movie did an excellent job of introducing one of the major issues for us, and, and something that we spend a lot of time and energy on, and that is uh, protecting, enhancing, and even understanding uh, what's happening with our tidal wetlands. And as, you, as everyone now knows from the movie, these tidal wetlands are really some of our first um, defenses against sea level rise, increasing intensity of storms. Um, they're also some of our, the most valuable places that we have, which I think the movie did a, a great job of pointing out. They're where all of our fish are born. They're a tremendous driver of economic activity when it comes to fish and those kinds of things. They also filter water, so they clean the water. And so one of the big challenges that we see in Delaware is a, a state that ha just has so much water in it um, is that these wetlands are incredibly important to us. If we lose them, not only will we be more, the, the coastal towns and areas around them will be more vulnerable to damage and sea level rise and storms, but we'll also lose a tremendous amount of productivity in terms of fish and our water quality will really suffer. So um, uh, one of our major efforts is trying to protect and enhance this coastal wetlands. And so the article that, that was in the news journal, that was perfect timing for this. We couldn't have, um, you know, of course we can't choose when that's gonna happen, but it was great timing for this. It's all about a program that we have that is really focused on um, not just protecting and restoring wetlands, but understanding them. It's amazing to think, the movie points out that we have lost a tremendous amount of our wetlands, and yet for the type of estuary that we are, um, and you know, in a major metropolitan area, um, the the fact that we have so many of our wetlands left is actually quite remarkable, and they range all the way from very lucky, very lucky, all the way from the very salty um, tidal marshes around Delaware Bay up all the way through Philadelphia and to Trenton. We have freshwater tidal wetlands that are incredibly important as well, and so those are a big focus for us, not just for the wetlands themselves, but for all the value that they provide. And remarkably, you would think of this, you know, the 
all that we know about wetlands that we would know, we would have all the science down by now, but we, we started a program of actually assessing our wetlands for um, where we have wetlands and don't have wetlands, and then really starting to look at their health and what's putting stresses on them. And really got into that work in probably, you know, around 2008. And when we first started doing that, um, we had to visit, you know, we were using things like National Wetland Inventory Maps, which is kind of a standard map that is all around the country for wetlands. Um, and some of the first places we assessed were, you know, in, in southeastern Pennsylvania. We had to visit 60 places where these maps told us there should be wetlands to find 30 places to assess. So half the places that the maps were telling us should be wetlands were no longer wetlands. Um, and so that's something we've been really working on, even just improving we the information. Been, we've destroyed yeah. wetlands all across America. We yeah. have. And, it, and they're such a valuable resource. Yeah, and we continue to lose them. That, I mean, that's right. for the first time, because of this science and new data that we have, we now know that we're losing an acre of wetland a day around the Delaware estuary. So that is just in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, around the Delaware River and Bay. So that's one of our top priorities. Well, we're having some more questions for you, and I guess we can move on to Alice Garan, who, who knows more, more people here than, than I do, <laughs> that's for sure. But uh, you're working on issues of sea level rise and assessing their impact on historical cultural resources. And we have a number of them in, in Delaware. Right. Um, how, how are you doing? Uh, <laughs> well, um, historical resources are everywhere. So um, we have archaeological sites, we have historic buildings and bridges and historic dikes and historic towns that are all in the way of sea level rise. And so there are some conflicts between the environmental path and what we would like to take is the historical path to maintain and preserve our past. Um, but there are, there are a lot of issues. Um, this is nothing new. 1926, the uh, Cape and Lopen Light fell into the ocean. So this has been a problem in Delaware for a long time. And it's going to require a lot of, of of discussion and decision making about where are we going to put our money to preserve the historic places that we most value that are in the coastal zone. Um, we have archaeological sites. We do not have a complete archaeological inventory of the coastal zone. We have uh, historic villages and we don't have a complete inventory of them. So our office is trying to work on a uh, a coastal survey of the communities, hopefully, sometime this summer, but we don't have the money right now to do a wide archaeological a assessment. And, you know, um, and people say, well, historic properties are everywhere, so why can't we just let these go? Well, some of them are really important to us, and, so, and if we don't know what we're losing, how are we going to make those decisions wisely? That's right. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Professor McNeil from the University of Delaware, Engineering and, and Environmental Science. And by the way, we'd love to, to show this at the University of Delaware. We haven't done it yet. Right. It, it should be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, the movie and the discussion raises lots of interesting questions um, about um, opportunities, challenges, complex problems. Um, so I put on my engineering hat in one, in one sense, I put my environmental engineering hat on in another, and I put my disaster science hat on for another, as well as my public health policy, and I'm completely conflicted. <laughs> um, so, as you work in these areas, part of it is, you know, the last comment, we engineer a seawall to present, to prevent, uh, to create this engineered barrier. But that creates a problem in itself. It changes the ecology, the environment. We have had years of experience of Fish and Wildlife and Army Corps of Engineers doing major projects. Um, ranging from beach replenishment to rebuilding dunes that have unintended consequences. And 
one of the things we have to think about from a research point of view and a sort of academic point of view is, is to think broadly about this. Um, we try to train the next generation of engineers not to just build things, to think about who they're building it for and why they're building it. And so as I looked at the film to start before this event, I was so excited about the opportunity to show it to our students. So I think there's a lot of of interesting opportunities and challenges. There's a lot of research issues. Um, I was interested to see that the American Planning Association keynote speaker described this as a wicked problem. Wicked in not the sense of evil, but complex, difficult, um, and the fact that you've got this huge range of stakeholders that have different perspectives. This idea of do we want to preserve cultural assets, do we want to preserve natural environments, or do we want to take natural courses and, you know, yeah, sure the houses will get washed away. And, you know, it, money does make, make an awful lot of difference and, and, you, and you need it, and there's a limited amount. Absolutely. So it seems to me in, in beach nourishment, for example, to replace the boardwalk in Rehoboth, you have to have it because it's millions of dollars of, of tourist income, and if you don't have that, you right. lose it. So the price-earnings ratio is pretty good. Right. But to restore a beach that has three or four or five houses on it uh, for millions of dollars so that one or two could get out there under the umbrella, we can't afford to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have to make these choices, I believe. And understand what right. those trade-offs are and what's involved. Uh, Kelly, Kelly Valenchek is from uh, Delaware Department of, Envir of uh, Natural Resources and Environmental Control. And I say it properly, it's yep. DENREC. Yep. And uh, you saw Colin O'Mara, who was secretary of, uh, of DENREC for, for a while. And I, I work with him because I work with the Florida Wildlife Federation, a very important part of that group. But Kelly, I understand you're, you're developing a sea uh, adaptation program. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish you very well. If we can help, <laughs> we will. Luck we can get and all the help Tell that us we can about get. It. So, yes, I um, work through the Center Act Agency, and you saw both of my old boss and new boss on the video as well, so I'll try to do them justice here. Um, I am actually out of the Delaware National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is a nationally, nationally funded agency from NOAA. Um, there's 20 national estuarine research reserves across the nation, um, everywhere from New York to three in Florida, three in California, and one in Alaska. And what our mission is, is to do research, education, and stewardship about our coastal and estuarine systems. So I'm out of our education department at the co with the coastal training program there. What I help to do is help educate our coastal decision makers about the latest and greatest information on sea level rise and climate change and what's coming out there and really put these great resources that we have developed from all of our agencies into their hands so they can help make better decisions on how they're going to adapt to climate change and sea level rise. Um, we are run through the Department of Natural Resources at the Reserve, so our sister um, office is the Delaware Coastal Programs Office, which is tasked with balancing our uses of the coastal resources here in the state of Delaware, both balancing our resources for industry, commercial, tourism, and our natural resources, and you know, still being tree huggers and bunny lovers and all that stuff too. So balancing all those things, Excellent. there's a lot of conflicting uh, wants and needs between them all. So. Um, what we've been trying to do is help our state start to prepare for these impacts of sea level rise and climate change. Um, I help the Coastal Programs Office um, staff the Delaware Sea Level Rise Adaptation Committee, where we brought together a group of about 30 different statewide stakeholders to start discussing um, how Delaware might be vulnerable to sea level rise. We were able to pull together lots of data on an inventory of different state resources, um, anywhere from schools to hospitals to wetland areas um, to um, uh, well, sewer areas and, and drinking water locations and see how they might be impacted by sea level rise in the future. Um, the stakeholders assessed that and provided some recommendations to the state on how we can start to take steps at the state level to adapt to sea level rise and we presented them to our Secretary of Generac 
um, who presented them to our governor, and we have now um, Executive Order 41 from Governor Markell that directs other state agencies to start planning for sea level rise adaptation. So that's that's all well and good for us, <laughs> but we lot. still have a lot to do <laughs> because we have to help. Uh, you know, not only the state level start to prepare, but also Before all of we our have local questions from the from yeah. the audience here, uh, <laughs> perhaps. You all could ask questions of me or one another, and we'll start again with you, Jen. Right. Well, I, you know, I think since we just saw the movie and you know it talks about the act, and given the challenges that we're all facing today, I'd love to hear from you about you know what were the challenges of, of getting them passed at the time, and, and is it, do you have any advice for us in terms of trying to move this issue forward today? Well, there were <laughs> tremendous challenges, uh, but uh, thank goodness. I had a good partner in John Chafee, that's for sure, and a number of others, and uh, had been very much involved with, uh, with Ronald Reagan's election in 1980, and I worked with him for a couple of years, uh, chairing the, the core group, which included Jack Kemp and Trent Lott and the whole, there were 12 of us, and we really uh, spent a great deal of time on it. And we became friends, and we supported one another, they were mostly conservative, I was a moderate, uh, but when I introduced this bill, they all supported it. And you wouldn't expect uh, that uh, the Secretary of Interior, uh, Jim, what the heck was his name? Why? Why? Jim Watt. He was probably one of the worst secretaries we've ever had as far as natural resources are concerned. But I had first met with Ed Meese and President Reagan, and they said, Tom, this is a good idea. And I focused on the money part, the fact we could spend a lot less if we did it the right way. And, uh, and they supported it. Jim Watt supported it. He went all out for it, <laughs> which is amazing. But he knew which side his bread was buttered on, that's for sure, because when Ronald Reagan said, you know, I really want this, uh, I want you to support Tom. In fact, I was in, in his office just with that base, and he picked up the telephone and he called, called Jim Watt and said, Jim, I want you to talk to Congressman Tom Evans, and you all set a time to get together. He's got a great idea. So what do you expect him to say? You know? <laughs> Anyway, uh, there were some good people on both sides of the aisle, Jen. We had, uh, we had Democrats and Republicans, and truly, uh, it, it ranged from individuals who were very conservative to individuals that were very liberal, like Gary Studs from Massachusetts, who died. Most of the people are dead, unfortunately. I'm still around to tell the tale. But uh, it, was a, it was a great fight. And I think a tremendous example for us today and for the Congress today of trying to work together instead of taking this position that everything you stand for, if you're a Republican, you can't support the environment or you can't support global warming or, or climate change. 17, 17 Republicans uh, and I know I'm not supposed to talk from a political standpoint, but this is true, and it needs to be said, not one of them, with the possible exception of, of John Kasich, believed the science of climate change. Even, even ExxonMobil's internal memos indicate that they understood there was climate change, and what, they're, and what they were trying to do then and what many are trying to do today is to create doubt about whether about the science. Just as the cigarette companies tried to create doubt for a, a number of years about whether cancer caused, I mean, drunk cancer was caused, lung cancer was caused by smoking cigarettes or cigars or anything else. And uh, they, they're trying to do the same thing, and they still are. Uh, hopefully, groups like this and this, and this film and others that, that are available 
uh, can help turn the, turn the tide and, and do it the right way. Alice? Um, one of our major concerns is to get invited to the table when these discussions are going on. Um, historic preservation, archaeology, buildings, etc. tends to be in this little spot over here and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of congressional and state legislative support for historic preservation. We've had some good things happen, but we need to be part of the conversation for these very complex issues about what we're going to do and how we're going to make our decisions. You know, and I, I would like to see somewhere when they're talking about sea level rise and adapting to it in, in our own news journal, which is the largest newspaper in the state of Delaware and the only statewide newspaper, mention the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. They don't have to mention me, but they should mention the, the role that the Coastal Barrier Resources Act plays, not once in a number of stories about sea level rise. Have I heard the word Coastal Barrier Resources Act mentioned? And that's sad. That is sad. The Delaware State News is much better about it. And uh, the Seaford News Leader and some of the other smaller newspapers are, are mentioning it. So talk to your friends at the, uh, and John, my God, John mentioned it big time. He did the best story we have ever had, including the ones in the New York Times and the Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. John Sweeney did a story on the history of the Coastal Barrier Resources Act in the Wilmington News Journal. Is that why you left? <laughs> anyway, thank you, John. So I do want to say that I do appreciate being part of the earlier discussions in state level where we had our planning meetings and I went to a number of the public meetings. Um, but you know, I was handicapped. I'm the research center manager for um, the State Historic Preservation Office. And I'm handicapped by the fact that I have not enough data about historic properties in the coastal zone. It just happens that the, the, where we spend our money on doing kind, different kinds of survey didn't happen to be in those areas. And now, how do I make my case? You know, I need to be able to make my case. You know, one of, one of the problems we has, have in terms of more data and, and more stories and, and people understanding what it's all about lies with the environmental groups in the state of Delaware. I'll bet you not one of them can tell you that we have 30,000 acres in the coastal barrier resources system in the state of Delaware. Now much of that is, is wetlands, but uh, uh, several thousand acres are fast land. But I'll bet you not one can can say that, Professor. Um, so I, one of the things that I have a sense of is that Hurricane Sandy gave us an opportunity, and I'm concerned that that opportunity is fading. That we haven't cashed in on it enough to do the education, the awareness building, um, etc. Did you see it as an opportunity? Yeah, I, I think there's some opportunities. Yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some money there. left over from Sandy, you know, because uh, a lot was created. Right. And so, uh, so how do we Governor Christie didn't Go. use it all, yeah. and he's not giving it to his to his friend who's running for president. <laughs> but anyway, there is some money left over, and I think uh, I think we could engage some of our members of, of the Senate and our one member of the House. In, the, in this effort. Because uh, one of the things we did at Metropolitan Planning Agencies, and this was very much focused on um, the Transportation Metropolitan Planning Agencies, we did, was we had done a survey of awareness and activities pre-Sandy, and then we did another one six months afterwards, and the two scales were completely different. These were mid-Atlantic Metropolitan Planning Agencies. Yeah. They were, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we're sort of interested, there's something going on, and then after Sandy, Oh, this is really important. We need to be doing Well, this. use that example that I gave in my opening remarks about Katrina yes. and New Orleans 
Now, a lot of that was, was mankind doing it, but a lot was nature as well. Uh, but we, we took it, we, uh, Billy Tozan was the member of Congress from down there and became a senator and, and, a, and a very good guy. Uh, but we made an exception for them to restore some of the barrier lands. And, uh, and it was a good thing to do. And, and we let people like that, everybody in Congress had a chance to talk about what they wanted included in the Coastal Barrier Resources Act. And many of them did. I mean, I'll tell you, I burned the midnight oil with, with, with many of them and probably drank more beers than I should have. But anyway, it was, uh, that's, that's how it happened. That's absolutely how it happened. Kelly? So I think that what we should be um, doing right now is preparing ourselves for the next opportunity that we have a high visibility event happen. To be ready to act, be ready to, I don't know, pass a legislation or implement a new planning ordinance in a local community um, once these things occur. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what we kind of feel like we have to wait for is another big storm to hit for people to have the, the wake up call again. But we have to be ready to um, jump on that and, and take advantage of um, people's heightened awareness of those occurrences. Um, I think that some of our role can be to remind people what's been happening um, in the past years, you know, using some of the, you know, visualizations that we can put together and, and um, always put out there through our outreach and education about this is how high the water was um, back then. Don't you remember? Um, do you remember that you got um, shut in your house for three days because the water didn't drain away from your roadway to get out to go to work? So I think we need to be able to communicate that um, to State of Delaware, um, as well as be ready to act in the future. Thank you. And I would definitely, you know, just to pick up, I, I definitely think there's been a huge different shift in thinking since, and you know, maybe not just with Sandy, but with Irene. Katrina and Sandy and Irene, between the three of them, impacted just about any, everyone in, in our region and beyond. And so even though it might not feel like we have completely capitalized on that opportunity, Things are very different. I mean, there was a time not that long ago that as an organization, a science-based organization that wanted to be out there talking about climate change, it was very difficult to even talk about it. And that, that has completely changed. So the, the public's awareness is definitely very different. And you know, I agree with everything that you were saying, Kelly, about like needing to be ready for the next opportunity. But we're also, we've also sort of shifted to a, a completely different level. I yeah, think because that's several, several years ago, uh, even even three or four or five uh, people said, "Oh, it's not settled settled science. Uh, there is no climate change." Some of the some of the senators was saying there was a senator from Oklahoma, I'll, she'll be unnamed, who said it's all hoax. Climate change is a hoax. Mary Page, you had a question. The main thing is it should not be a political issue. It's not a Democrat or Republican thing. It's everybody's. I don't know why it has to, Republicans don't believe it and Democrats do. I think it's ridiculous that it should be for It is totally, totally all, not a political issue. No, not at all. Joe, still. Joe has also done a number of different things here in the state of Delaware very effectively. Joe, I'll give you this. Uh, I'm very interested. One of my heroes, Delaware heroes, was Russ Peterson, who was governor and passed the Coastal Zone Act. And I remember seeing maps of farmland all down through Kent and Sussex County showing Sun Oil and other oil companies buying it up. The motivation for them was if they were able to build refineries all the way down Delaware's coastline from Claymont down to Rehoboth and beyond, that the ships would not have to go to Marcus Hook to pick up the oil yeah. or to do things like that. So I was wondering in the timing, and you did tremendous things at the federal level, but the Coastal Zone Act was passed, it's my understanding, by only one vote, as I recall. 
and I, I think it was Tommy Little. Well, the Coastal sure. Zone Act was passed by one vote by the by the legislature. That's right. And and actually, I didn't bring it tonight, but there's a thick thing, <laughs> thick book. It's about 500 pages. A report of the coastal barrier of the of the task force on marine and coastal affairs, and I was Russ's first appointment ah, to that task force. I was and wondering how the how you interface to them, but I if you can imagine where Delaware would be today if we had refineries down the entire coast, we would not have a Lewis Beach, we would not have the South Bethany Beach, we would not have things. That would all be so. I think at the local level and what you did at the federal level were just really tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John has talked to me a, a lot about using the uh, the principles uh, of the Coastal Barrier Resources Act in perhaps some other ways uh, because this. This only applied to, COBRA only applied, applied to non-developed areas. It did not apply to developed areas. Uh, but there are some places that, uh, like uh, Duck, North Carolina, that have McMansions on the coastline, and the money we give them is welfare for the wealthy. We can't do that. Uh, and it, I guess you know you can say well if you if you if you do it once do it twice if it happens again it's your responsibility. What do you think, John? Here, take this. <clears throat> well, uh, a, li a little story. A friend of mine, a, a Pulitzer Prize winner from the Asbury Park Press, uh, an investigative reporter, and so forth, and he told me right after Sandy hit. Uh, that they immediately went into the whole staff, they brought up every stringer that they could to cover the various aspects of the damage of, this, of the storm and what happened. Then he said, we're gonna go on to why weren't we prepared and so forth. He knew all of this was coming because he's a student of how our government in the larger sense of the word works. And he said, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cover the corruption that's gonna come out of it all the payoffs, all of the deals from the aid that's coming in, the people who are going to rebuild the houses for the third and fourth time, and it was all predictable, and sure enough, that's what happened. So that is something environmentalists should be aware of, and you can almost predict that when it, the next time it's going to happen, you can point out saying, there's where your tax dollars are going to go, and it is not just Republicans, but it is Democrats as well, people at local levels, uh, as well as state level, county levels, uh, state levels and federal. So we have a serious problem with the way we're supervising all of this as well. You know, there's a heck of a lot of greed involved, uh, a lot of greed and a lot of payoffs. And, and uh, I say to conservative friends of mine that, uh, that Adam Smith, who was the the guru of, of the conservatives in the, in the country said, you know, if there's too much greed, our system doesn't work. And he was right. And we need to do something. The state archaeologist has a, has a question or a comment. Um, yes, thank you. I'm um, one of Alice's colleagues, yes. Um, what I'd like to suggest, this is a very old activity that really defines Delawareans. We've been struggling against uh, the water's encroachment since uh, for 300 years. The Dutch have built dikes, as we know, in um, Newcastle, Wilmington, Odessa in the 1660s. We've had, um, there are passageways, there are canals that have been cut through the wetlands to access the waterways in the 17th century. We have uh, salt hay companies and dikes that have been, we have uh, built by private individuals for, for cultivation uh, before the revolution, um, and these these would I would see these as community uh, oriented ways to, to control the water, and then we've had the uh, the storms that washed them all away in the 1880s, and then after that we had the highway department rebuild some of them, and then we've had the CCC come in and put in mosquito ditching and, and more dikes. 
And here we are today looking at the, late, the latest big storm that's coming our way. So I would suggest this really defines us as a people mm -hmm. in the long run. <laughs> I think, you know, one thing that... I hope brings... you'll suggest that to our senators and our congressmen before he's running for governor. Sure. Uh, you all have some comments about that. Well, one thing I was just going to mention, I think that, you know, we're all going to be challenged with resources when it comes to protecting the things, whatever, whether it's historic or um, infrastructure or natural infrastructure and wetlands and things like that. There are going to be huge challenges about decisions and investment. And so when I think about some of the dikes and some of the historic resources and some of the projects that have worked well and that I think we're coming around to more, they have multiple benefits. And I think we have to focus on some of those kinds of things. So if there is, I know some of the dikes in Newcastle are an amazing recreational resource. So their, their infrastructure, their history, they can serve an important recreational, re as a recreational resource. Some of those dikes from our perspective are actually protecting inundation of some wetlands. So finding the nexus of the, of the things that we can protect that have the most benefits, I think is the way that we need to start looking at some of these things um, because we're, we are not going to have the resources to protect everything in a state like Delaware we, where we have so much at risk. What do you think, Alice? Well, I think it's quite true. Uh, we need to decide what is most important to our people. Yeah. Um, you look at the Look at the town of Lewis with an incredible historic district there. Uh, they're very active. They have their own review commission. And they're also, they're one of the first, one of the first towns to start considering sea level rise and how they're going to adapt to it. They're doing a good job, by the way. Yes, they are. That issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to encourage more of that. And we also need to encourage <coughs> looking at all the ways to adapt, not just retreat. Uh, it's not the first, it might not be the first option. Um, maybe in the end it's the only option, but we need to look at ways in which we can adequately protect what we most value. You know, Lewis, uh, five or six weeks ago, part of it was underwater. And that's the one thing about sea level rise. Long before any place is inundated, you get these floods. And when the moon is right, it's high tide. When the new moon is there, yeah. it's, it, and, and if they all combine, and they have, I mean, that's what happened in 1962. And Mary Page, you and I just got married. We were down there looking at all that, that everything was just torn apart. There was nothing left on the north end of the boat boardwalk. Nothing. And you remember that, Bobby, too. So Susan? This, this goes back to the wicked problem, that there's trade-offs in all of those things. So, um, but I think we've got to not lose sight of um, of essentially the same principles of sustainability, you know, environment, equity, um, uh, 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 social conservation, and, um, renewable resources, and and the economic. Because if we let the economic engine drive it, That's right. we're going to make some bad decisions. Because people want jobs, and and it, let me tell it's, you, it's I, important, I, I make a point. Life. I make a point about that in terms of jobs. Whether, whether it's caused by mankind or whether it's caused by the natural cycle of nature, we have sea level rise and we need to adapt to it. And that means you need conservation and you need renewable resources. You've got to have that. And, and by the way, that's hundreds of thousands of good engineering jobs and science that need to be to be hired for that. And and so that I think that's a very good point to make with anyone who says, well, I don't believe in the science of sea level rise. Okay, you don't. Uh, we're not gonna argue that right now, but we do have sea level rise and here's what we need to do. So 
So one of the things is to, in every decision, whether it's a preservation of a historic thing or protecting a natural environment or building a new development, automatically saying, what is the impact of, of potential climate change on this? Because you, yeah. you want to make good decisions. And unless you begin to ask those questions, um, so a, a simple example, the proposed new Claymont rail station um, would have the approaches underwater under most storms. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so as soon as you ask the questions, it becomes obvious that we have to, well, the redesign has been done, but that was one of the things that when you start to ask the question of, oh, this was a silly way of looking at it. And it applies to many different things of, of, of raising awareness, asking those questions when we're trying to make decisions. Yeah. Any other comments here or, or questions? Um. I was just going to say that I, I think he needs to take advantage of the win-win situations. You know, even if folks aren't on board that climate change is happening and that we need to prepare for it, we can even at this point say, okay, well, we're going to build to a higher standard or a more sturdy structure that can withstand storms, you know, in the near term, in the short term, and prepare for hurricanes like Sandy or even huge winter storms like Jonas, you know, we'll be more prepared for sea level rise and climate change in the future as well. So it's the really a win-win situation. So pre preparing for one prepares you for the other. I think, you know, taking the precautionary principle into, into play with all this will really help put us out in front. Um, and we certainly want to advocate, you know, um, being proactive about adapting to sea level rise and climate change rather than being reactive and having to spend millions of dollars to repair and come back from this tons of storm damage where we can take common sense approaches to dealing with sea level rise and, and put our sea level rise goggles on and look through our plans um, with that. And certainly, um, you know, moving structures out of areas at risk to sea level rise, not placing them in those places, building to a higher elevation or including freeboard and new homes or rebuilt structures. So there's a lot of, you know, simple steps that we can take today that will save us millions of dollars in the future. We're lucky and fortunate in Delaware to have a a group like this, these young ladies that, uh, that work so hard for all of us uh, and particularly for the future because that's what it's all about. And, and uh, we also have some, some of God's creatures here that don't have a voice and we need to speak up for them too. Uh, and anyway, thank you all for being here and thank you for being here especially. We appreciate it very much.